Amen. Come on up, Jason. We want to welcome everybody that's joining us online this morning. Come on, can you welcome them? Thank you for being uh, with us today. And uh, today I am actually not speaking. We have the wonderful and often asked for and sought after Jason Thorpe, one of our very own here in our church. Um, he has spoken several times. If you've never met Jason, uh, Jason is a dear friend. Um, he's smarter than I am. He knows more Bible than I do. Um, and uh, he's, he's a tremendous, has a tremendous heart for God. And uh, he's actually also on the board for St. John's County now for the FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Um, yeah, a newly appointed or asked or coerced. I don't know how it would, yeah, would actually go. One of them. Yeah, but um, I, I, he actually texted me this week and he said, you're not going to be at church Sunday, are you? And I said, well, yeah, I plan on it. He said, you're not actually going to try to talk, are you? I said, well, I was planning on it. He said, absolutely not. And uh, I said, well, you're up. I mean, it didn't, what was it, one text? Yeah. I said, yeah, go for it. You got it. You can take it. So uh, everybody, would you help me welcome and honor Jason Thorpe this morning? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I smoke, uh, snuck in a little early to church this morning uh, so I could come up here and place two Bibles on the lectern. And I know what you guys are thinking. Two Bibles and the Jags have an off week. We may be here a while. Let not your hearts be troubled. <clears throat> There's a couple of things going on that I don't know that I like. For 30 some years, I have always prepared my notes uh, by hand on canary yellow paper. And this week, with the rush, I did not. I actually typed them out. So it makes me feel a little uneasy because I believe there's an anointing in the canary yellow legal pads. <clears throat> and to make things worse, I had a day of tennis yesterday with my youngest daughter. And I had my notes printed up and I left them on my desk. And when I got home last night, I went and grabbed them and brought him into my bedroom and was reviewing the notes, and I thought, man, I need my glasses. And I looked around, and by golly, I had my glasses on. <clears throat> and that just tells me there's more candles on the birthday cake. So, that's like two strikes against me this morning, and I'm still trying to recover. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to teach again out of John chapter 2. A few months ago, we talked out of John 2 and Jesus' first miracle, him turning water into wine, and we looked at it from the perspective of the servants and the obedience of the servants. And today, I really want to go back to that same text, but I want to focus this morning on the interaction between Mary and Jesus. There's three sentences that are so tough to reconcile as, I believe, as a Christian. Um, I want to look at those, and I want to look at what I call Mary's miracle. So if you have your Bibles, John chapter 2, and I'm, going to, uh, I'm just going to read the first Five verses here to start. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine, mine hour has not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And then if you turn or look down to verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that for the next few minutes, 
you would quiet our hearts, remove every obstacle to divine communication. Lord, let the, um, the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you. And Father, I pray that when we leave this place, our neighbors, our colleagues, our community would say, surely they have been with the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so to begin, we want to get a refresher on the Jewish wedding. The Jewish wedding was a huge event in the life of a community. Outside of the three major feasts that uh, Jews would travel to Jerusalem for, a wedding was the next greatest celebration in the timeline of a family and of that city for that year. Huge event. And let me explain the process to you a little bit. What would happen, it was a two-stage process, very similar to what we do here in the United States with an engagement. They called it a betrothal. That betrothal was done uh, one of two ways. It was done with money or with a contract. So the groom would come to the father of the bride-to-be, he would either negotiate a contract with them, I want to marry your wife or your daughter, um, and there would be a contractual agreement written up. Or, and or, the groom would come to the father of the bride-to-be, and he would say, here's a lump sum of money. Um, I would like to buy the marriage rights to your daughter. Then what would happen if it, if it was agreed upon, there would be a period of time, <clears throat> normally about a year, but it could be as long as seven years, uh, that the groom would then go off and he would get with his dad and he would make accommodations for um, the marriage, for their life afterwards. This usually entailed building a house. It was normally in conjunction with the house of the, uh, of the father already. Um, they would also begin to make preparations for the wedding feast because the wedding feast was, again, what? A major event in the life of the family and the community. This would be a week-long event where, you know, you really didn't invite some people and not others. I mean, just about the entire city, especially, especially in a place like Cana that was a very small village, everybody would have been invited. Neighboring villages may have been invited. It was a big deal. So it was a big responsibility on the groom and his family to be able to provide for wine and for some sort of fooding, uh, food for the week of activities. Okay, so that's what they're doing as they prepare. The time's getting close, and now the bridegroom collects his party, and he now tells the, the, the father of the bride, such and such day I'm coming. He has his whole entourage. They come down the main street of the village, and it's like a parade. <clears throat> and they come to the house of the bride. They collect her. They bring her back to the house that they just built. And then it's a week long of festivities where the bride and groom are basically treated like royalty. Okay? It's a big deal. Just like we know from studying Scripture, um, sometimes man can get in the way and we can add on some things to customs, and that's what they did in the wedding ceremony, so to speak, this week-long activity. Somewhere down the line, it actually became law that if you ran out of food and wine, that it could be a criminal offense to the groom, and or the people responsible for getting the food and the wine together. Okay, so we think it's a lot of pressure now to host a, a few hour event. And let's make sure we have enough chicken wings and, and meatloaf or whatever we're having. Can you imagine for a week? And if it doesn't go to par, you run out of something, you could be charged criminally. So now we come back to our text. <clears throat> So we see here that Jesus, four, possibly five disciples are invited uh, at this point in time to the wedding. Many scholars believe that this is John the disciple's wedding. 
Uh, John the disciple would have been a relative to Jesus. That's why we see Mary, the mother of Jesus, being involved with the planning and the preparation. Um, so Mary now, if she runs out of wine, could somehow be charged. So that's where we pick up the story. And there's four points I want to make to you this, this morning. Point number one, problems often carry hidden and deep pains. They have no wine. I hope when we leave here this morning, I hope you use this phrase for a number of different instances throughout your, your week. I hope when something goes wrong, there's an unexpected bill, there's something wrong at work, I hope you just you think in your mind, they have no wine. Words can oftentimes have double meanings. We are all very familiar with this. Let me give you one such example. To all the men and husbands in the service this morning, when you're having an emotionally charged conversation with your significant other, also known as an argument, and you hear your spouse in the middle of one of your points or counterpoints say, wow, we all innately know that she is not amazed by our intellectual capabilities. We kind of understand that that means I can't believe you are that dumb to say that out loud to me. Understood? Words can have double meanings. Mary came to Jesus, and I want you to file that away, but she comes to Jesus and she says, they have no wine. Mary was the person that Jesus knew best in this world. She was his mother. Joseph has died somewhere along the, the way. Jesus now, as the eldest, has stepped into that family provisionary role. Do you just imagine what some of the examples and instances and scenarios and things that may have gone up when Jesus was growing up? There was never a doubt recorded in Scripture that Mary knew Jesus was the Messiah. Nowhere in Scripture does it say she wavered from that. In fact, she told the angel when he was telling her, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, you're going to give birth to a son, he's going to be the Messiah, you're going to name him Jesus. Her response is simply, let it be unto thy servant as you have said. And there's no biblical evidence elsewhere that says she ever wavered from the understanding that Jesus was the Son of God and the Messiah. But do you ever wonder what may have happened growing up that maybe solidified or fortified or reassured her he's the Messiah? I wonder if there was ever an instance where she asked Jesus to go down and pick up some bread for dinner. And he says, Mom, I've got a construction project doing school tomorrow. Are you sure we're out? Will you check the pantry one more time? Or if she takes him swimming at the lake, and she's walking him down to the lake, and she says, Jesus, we're going to need you to swim in the lake like the other kids. <laughs> I mean, who knows? <clears throat> we're taking some creative liberties, but there had to have been some instances where things just mysteriously happened for her benefit, for the family's benefit. And she comes to him at this time, and she says, they have no wine. And I think she's saying three things that we all deal with as people this morning. I believe, one, she's saying there's pain and ridicule and persecution that I'm dealing with. Make it go away. 
I believe there's shame of a situation. Jesus, you know what this means culturally to us, socially. To be shamed. Shame is a psychological weapon that Satan uses against all of us. That compares ourselves to a standard or a, or a level that's unattainable. And when we don't hit it, shame forces us to paint a broad stroke over is what to uh, be meant to be a very narrow mark. We oftentimes confuse shame and conviction, or guilt and conviction, or condemnation and conviction. Shame and condemnation and guilt. They are psychological weapons that keep us from God and keep us from using our gifts for the kingdom. They usually paint a very broad picture and they say, hey, you may have failed in this area, but now your entire life is a failure. Everything you are is a failure. This is who you embody. This sin, this addiction, this in iniquity, whatever it may be, this thought pattern. And I believe when she came to Jesus and she said, they have no wine, I think she was revealing to him, I don't want to have to deal with the shame any longer. I think the third thing was fear of the unknown. What does this mean for me and my family going forward if we truly do run out of wine? We've been ridiculed in the past. How much worse will it be in the future if this happens? How do we know that they were ridiculed? There's a very unique and interesting, uh, very Almost, a, you would miss it if you weren't looking for it. In John 8 and 41, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And he's basically telling them, hey, you say you're, you're children of Abraham, but you're really not. Because if you were, you would love me. And you would love my words. You can't love the Father and hate the Son. Is, is in essence, in, in summary, what he's telling them. And they come back to him and said, we are children of Abraham. We were not born under fornication. And if you don't think that was a veiled, or maybe not even a veiled, but an openly, socially shot across the bow at Jesus and his birth, you need to reread scripture. And if they said it to him in front of the temple, I guarantee you they gave the side eye and made those comments to Mary and Joseph for 30 plus years. And the ridicule and the shame and the embarrassment that they had to live with, knowing every time they went to the temple, every time they went to the synagogue, every time they went around the church leaders, every time they went into the community, that somebody, they felt that, that, that look. They felt that feeling of, you're not good enough. You've made some things up in your life to, to cover up a sin. You're lying to yourself, Mary. And I think she comes to Jesus at this moment in time, and she says, they have no more wine. And I think the hidden and the deep pains that she's revealing is shame, is ridicule, is fear. The very same things that we all deal with today. There's verses in the Bible that I hate to memorize. How about that for an opening? Romans chapter 5 happens to be one of them. Romans chapter 5 gives us a very detailed explanation on something I think is a point that is proven here in this text. Picking up in verse 3, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. That word glory is... is Better translated, rejoice. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, now hope does not disappoint. Every good Christian really doesn't like to memorize that scripture. Okay? I mean, let's be honest. 
Because we, if we know we, we memorize it, we know we're going to have to use it. And then we know, oh, great, I'm going to have to go through some tribulations. And I'm going to have to develop perseverance. I'm going to have to develop character. And then hopefully that, that brings about hope. In this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And if we go through the natural progr- uh, progress of, of that uh, text, and let me relate it back to John chapter 2, tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, hope does not disappoint. So what does hope do? Hope appoints. Tribulation leads to perseverance, perseverance leads to character, character leads to hope, hope leads us to divine appointments. Mary came to Jesus, and they have no wine. And what she didn't know was that for 30 years, as she had gone through tribulations in her life, and she had been mocked and ridiculed and made fun of, she had been made to feel shame and embarrassment, she had been made to feel fear of the unknown, that during this time, she was Going through this tribulation, she was producing perseverance. Perseverance was producing character. Character was producing hope. That hope drove her to Jesus and said, they have no wine. And she didn't know that at that very point in time, she was inviting and allowing God the opportunity to create a divine appointment in her life. That's why we don't give up and we come to Jesus regardless of how long you've been in the tribulation, regardless of how long you've been in this situation, how much you want to quit, don't give up, and you come back to Jesus. Point number two, there's a perspective change. This is where we have to read out of the King James Version. So bear with me. I don't normally study or preach out of the King James, but I think it has the best translation for two verses we're going to look at. Okay, so let's, let's tackle the, the issue in the room, right? This was the very first public ministry that Jesus was going to perform. I've told you in the past, as a salesman, I have some innate issues with mark, marketing departments. I think that they stub their toe a whole lot, and it makes my job a lot more difficult. So now I want to naturally blame somebody. I blame marketing. And this is the first miracle in Jesus' public ministry, and we're going to start it off with these words. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not come. Come on, marketing. We... We've got to have something better than that. And I've read a lot of commentary on those two sentences. And let me tell you, people that I respect and that I know are Christians and that they will be in heaven, and I think they've totally missed it. Okay? Bear with me. A lot of commentators, a lot of scholars will tell you a couple things. They'll say, well, this was Jesus giving a gentle rebuke to his mother. Or it was Jesus separating himself from being under the authority now of his mother to now separating himself and, hey, it's now a a divine authority and it's about ministry in the cross. Some will say he had to say this because... He had to get Mary to stop identifying Jesus as her son and look at him as her Messiah. Every mother in this room who has a son will tell you there is nothing that anybody could say or do that would ever keep them from identifying as the mother to their son. So we have an issue here. What does these two sentences mean? And I struggled with this because this is, this is a great moment in time. 
I mean, it's, it's a fantastic miracle. It's the first miracle. There's a law first use. So anytime there, something's done for the first time, it's really important in the Bible. So you come back to Jesus' first miracle and you study this and you look at it and you read it and, woman, what have I to do with thee? And I'm like, what in the world is going on? Jesus, did you have a moment here? I mean, what? Jesus addresses Mary twice that is recorded in Scripture. Both times, he uses the exact same word, translated woman. He did it here. He did it hanging on the cross when he looked at Mary and John, the disciple, and said, woman, behold your son. Transferring sonship from himself to John the disciple. When we look at the word woman, it's better translated madam. Now, I'm not saying madam is as comfy and cozy as mama, okay? But it sure is a lot better than woman, all right? So let's just think Jesus was responding and always addresses his mother in a very respectful way. Madam, ma'am. What does this have to do with thee? I struggled with that sentence. And I was reading in 2 Samuel 16. And this is where ridicule still shines its head in the church because I will tell you it was the Holy Spirit that showed me or spoke to me concerning the correlation of these two verses. And there are some today still in the church that would say God no longer speaks outside the Bible. And that is a form of ridicule. And I'm not here to argue. I'm not here to debate. I'm just here to tell you I'm not smart enough to put these two verses together. It had to be the Holy Spirit, okay? 2 Samuel chapter 16. This is a story. David is trying to be overthrown by his son, Absalom, uh, as king of Israel. Okay, so things aren't going real well for David personally. There is a servant from King uh, Saul's uh, family lineage that comes out to meet David. And let me pick this up um, in verse 5, 2 Samuel 16, 5. And when King David came to the Hurrium, behold, then came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou man of Belial, reprobate would be a good translation. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose uh, stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom unto the hand of Absalom, thy son. And behold, thou art taken into thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Because of everyone you've killed, and because of all the blood that you have shed, David, you don't deserve to be king. Rather, your son Absalom deserves to reign and to be king. We want to completely bypass you and go straight to your son. That's what he's saying here. Then Abishai, the son of Zariah, said unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. How many of you want friends like this guy? I mean, I need him walking behind me so I can run my mouth a little bit. And the king said, what have I to do with you? The very same phrase that Jesus says in John chapter 2. He goes on and says, maybe Shimmy is cursing me because it's God's plan. 
in John chapter 2, we are amiss if we don't realize that Jesus intricately and intimately knows the Word of God. In John chapter 1, it, it starts with, the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We know that the Word was Jesus. We know that when Jesus was tempted in the desert for 40 days, he quoted out of the book of Deuteronomy three separate verses to combat Satan and his temptations. I've been a Christian for over 35 years. I don't know that I can quote one verse out of Deuteronomy. He quoted Psalm 22 on the cross. One of my favorites, he knew Scripture so well, he could use similes and analogies in his teachings. We love the, 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 the I am statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? I mean, we all kind of know that one from vacation Bible school, and we say that when it's appropriate and get all excited and Pentecostal. Do you know that I am the way, the truth, and the life represents the three doors that were originally built in the tabernacle when Israel was wandering around in the desert? There were only three doors into that tent. A door on the outer wall coming into the, the court. You would sacrifice, you would wash, and then the priest could then go into the holy place where there was a menorah, a light, where there was an altar of incense, prayer, where there was uh, bread. And then there was a final door that went into the Holy of Holies that only one man could go into one time a year, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And each of those doors, the outer door was the, outer door was the way, the door going into the holy place was known as the truth, and the door going into the Holy of Holies was the life. So when Jesus stands up there and he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he's referencing Scripture and comparing it to him. I am it. He knows Scripture. So don't, don't think it's too much of a stretch here where Mary comes to him and says, we have no wine. And he says, ma'am, what have I to do with thee? It wasn't rocket science, and it wasn't re revealed to Jesus upon his ascension back into heaven after the, the crucifixion that he was of the lineage of King David. He would have known that gr growing up. He'd have been very familiar with that. And I think what we're seeing here is a gentle nudge on his mother saying, remember what great-granddaddy said when Shimmy was cursing him and David was hanging his head down low, and he said, what have I to do with thee? Maybe this is a God that has brought this man to curse me. I think it was Jesus letting his mother know, I get it. And maybe we just need to change our perspective and look at it as not a man-made occurrence and woe is me and I've created this mess. I can't get out of it. There's nothing I can do. Maybe he's saying this is a God divine appointment. And that God has arranged all of these factors to come into play right here, right now, so that something great can happen for you. A change in your perspective. A promise was made. Jesus says, mine hour has not yet come. Jesus uses the word hour seven times in the book of John. All seven times it's referencing the crucifixion. That was the hour that he was concerned with because Jesus' primary concern is always eternal. There is a concept in the Bible that you have to become very familiar with. It's called biblical tension. And it's, a, it's an already not yet scenario. And where we see this illustrated the greatest is in salvation. Because upon salvation, when you place your trust in Jesus as your Savior and King, you're saved already, not yet. And that's a concept that drives people crazy. Because we have a full deposit of the Holy Spirit, everything the Holy Spirit is, all of His essence that's been deposited into us as a seal, but yet we're waiting for the day of our redemption when the corruptible body puts on the incorruptible. And when our faith becomes sight, 
So while you can be 100% saved right now, you're not 100% saved until the incorruptible puts on the corruptible. And we're with Jesus for eternity. It's an already not yet. There's a biblical tension that we have to reconcile with. And when he says, my hour has not yet come, what he is whispering to Mary is, I see you. You will be vindicated, just not yet. And the hard part for us to realize is this. We often associate God's delay with his denial. And that's not biblical. Sometimes there is a natural waiting process. We are still today, November 5th, 2023, awaiting the day of our salvation. It is coming. It's not here today, this very moment. It is coming. Jesus said it was coming. It's that biblical tension of, okay, I'm here, but I'm waiting. I'm saved, but I'm waiting for the fulfillment. And I think what Jesus was saying here is, Mary, my hour's not yet come but it is coming. I've spoken it to you. There is a time set, up, set apart in heaven where I will go and be crucified, and it will fully vindicate every ill word, every ill attitude directed towards you and Joseph for these 30 years. It will vindicate you and say, yep, Mary was right. She knew her stuff. She really wasn't lying to us. But not yet. It's a promise and we wait on the promises of God. I want you to remember, it's always the cross that justifies us. And that's what Jesus was telling her. Regardless of what I do here and now, in this very instant, it won't fully justify you, Mary, until I get to the cross. And I come up out of the tomb three days later. Then everybody will know I am the Messiah and you'll have the evidence you've asked for. Just like for us today, it always goes back to the cross because it justifies us. We have a justification that is needed to come before God, and that's what the cross provides for us. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. At the cross... We traded our sins, our iniquities, our failures, our shame, our guilt, our fear for the reassurance and the salvation and the forgiveness that Christ offers. That makes us acceptable to God the Father. It also justifies us before our adversary, Satan, who accuses us day and night in the throne room. That's why we always go back to the cross. And we have to stake our anchor there at the cross to say, hey, no, no. I am justified. I'm justified before the Father. I'm justified in front of my enemy because of the cross. Finally, provision was made. In verse 11, you have to go back to English in seventh grade to follow me here, okay? So just bear with me. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, comma, and manifested forth his glory, comma, and his disciples believed on him. There are three separate and distinct actions in this one verse. I want to focus on the one manifested his glory. Sometimes in the church world, uh, we get confused, or, or maybe we're just simply uh, never been taught what some of the words we use really mean. Glory is one such word. I grew up in a church that uh, there was an usher. He was a large man. Uh, he had a booming voice. Pretty, um, pretty intimidating looking. And he would sit on the front row. And when the pastor would say something that this usher liked, he would yell out, glory. And he sounded like James Earl Jones. I mean, it was just, and he would do it four or five times in a, in a church service. And so growing up, my understanding of glory was, oh, you must say that when something good happens. Makes sense. The Georgia Bulldogs sing it all the time when they score touchdowns, you know. Some of you, 
some of you non-football fans will get that joke a little bit later. <clears throat> but glory has a unique meaning. There's two primary references to glory. We get a little bit confused because in the Old Testament, uh, when they built the tabernacle and then they completed the temple, uh, it's called the Shekinah glory came down, and there was a physical a smoke and a fire coming up out of the Holy of Holies. And, and so we, we think, okay, that's the manifest presence of God. And while it is, I'm not arguing that, the actual word itself has two major meanings. One is weightiness or heaviness. Um, I still don't know how to apply that biblically, but <laughs> every other pastor I respect seems to, so I'm going to go with it this morning. But the one that's really interesting is the one that that is essence. And there is a verse in Exodus chapter 33. Let's see what Bible am I going to read this out of? Exodus chapter 33. The Israelites have been bad. Moses is interceding for them. He's up on a mountaintop. He's having a di discussion with God the Father, and he says, Moses says, please show me your glory. Please show me your essence, what you're famous for, is, is really what he's saying. And here's the response from the Father. He said, I will make all my goodness passed before you. Jesus at his first miracle manifested his glory. He manifested, he made known, or he revealed his essence, which is the goodness of God, that he is a good God. So a provision was made. What does that really mean? Listen, the party was saved. 150 gallons of wine was delivered in an instant. They could go about their week-long festivities, whatever day they were into it. No one was going to get sued. Everybody's happy. But don't lose sight of the fact that at the very first miracle that Jesus ever performed, in all the different ways he could have done it, he could have raised people from the dead. He could have walked on water. He could have fed 10,000 people. He could have healed 100 lepers. He chose to look at a middle-aged woman, and he heard her cry, I'm tired of ridicule. I'm tired of shame, and I am fearful. And he says, I see your heart and I'm going to provide for you. Jesus is the good shepherd. He leaves the 99 to go after the one. And what he did in that act of turning water into wine was he said, I don't care what you've done or what you've experienced. I'm going to provide for the healing and the restoration of your soul because I care for you. And that's the point this morning. You matter to God. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of how you've acted, regardless of the things you've said, the shame that you carry around, you matter to God.